Time magazine called him the unsung hero behind the internet. CNN called him a father of the internet. President Bill Clinton called him one of the great minds of the information age. He has been voted history's greatest scientist of African descent. He is Philip M. Iguali. He's coming to Trinidad and Tobago to launch the 2008 Kwame Ture Lecture Series on Sunday, June 8th at the JFK Auditorium, Uwe St. Augustine, 5 p.m. The Emancipation Support Committee invites you to come and hear this inspirational mind adjust the theme, crossing new frontiers to conquer today's challenges. This lecture is one you cannot afford to miss. Admission is free, so be there on Sunday, June 8, 5 p.m. at the JFK Auditorium, New East St. Augustine. Back in the 1970s and 80s, the parallel process was to cross the border between the known vector supercomputer and the unknown an ensemble of 64 binary thousand processors that was a supercomputer hopeful. The upper limit of my quest for the fastest computation was my parallel processed supercomputing in the 64th mathematical dimension in which two raised to power 64 processors that were identical to each other had a one-to-one -one correspondence with the vertices of the cube in the 64th dimensional hyperspace. That upper limit in parallel processing will remain in the realm of science fiction. The word computer had different meanings to each generation. To most people, the laptop is the computer. Back in the 1980s, the desktop was the computer. However, one thing that has not changed is the definition of the computer as a machinery that at its core executes fast calculations. The supercomputer is any one of the 1,000 fastest computers in the world. I'm often asked, what makes a supercomputer super? For me, the new supercomputer that I invented was a new global network of processors that had no central pro control processor. The new supercomputer that I invented is a new internet because it executes its calculations across a new global network of processors. The fastest parallel processed computations and communications could only be experimentally discovered on the cusp between the dream, the dream between the dream planetary sized supercomputer and tomorrow's science fiction internet. I was the subject of school reports because I discovered how to evenly divide real-world grand challenge problems and discovered how to map those real-world problems and how to distribute them with a one problem to one processor correspondence and how to simultaneously solve those problems across millions upon millions of commodity processors that we are identical to each other and that shared nothing between each other. I emailed each smaller problem as a digital code of zeros and ones. I divided each grand challenge problem according to a set of rules. I gave each emailed code a header that described which processor the code is from. That header also described which processor should receive the code and where the code belongs in the grand challenge problem that is an ensemble of millions of smaller computational physics problems that each is an initial boundary value problem that is governed by my system of partial differential equations of calculus. The new mathematical knowledge that I just described is the mathematical essence of the Philip Emma Aguale formula for the world's fastest computer 
that then U.S. President Bill Clinton described in his White House speech of August 26, 2000 that made the news headlines. That new knowledge called practical parallel processing that I discovered on the 4th of July 1989 was what made the supercomputer super. The United States Constitution is amended occasionally to bring it up to 21st century reality. My supercomputer lectures must be similarly amended to bring them up to date. In particular, I had to enlarge what it means to smooth out the jagged frontiers of scientific knowledge and to contribute in the technological context of 21st century computer science. The quest for human progress is a journey to the future and to the terra incognita where the scientific discovery is the magical act of showing that sometimes that believed to be impossible is in fact possible. To invent or see something that was previously unseen is to create the future. It's like doing something no human had done before or like traveling to a planet no human had visited before. I define the supercomputer as any computer that is listed within the top 1,000 fastest computers in the world. By my definition, the few computers of the 1940s, 50s, and 60s were supercomputers. And the computers that I programmed in the 1970s and 80s were supercomputers. Retrospectively, and as a sub-Saharan African-born scientist in the United States who came of age in the 1970s and 80s, my scientific career took a path that some thought it should not have taken. Back in 1989, many people struggled to understand why a black man was the sole full-time programmer of the most massively parallel supercomputer ever built. The answer, in part, is that I started programming the CDC 3300, one of the world's fastest supercomputers back on June 20, 1974, at 1800 Southwest Campus Way, Covales, Oregon, United States. I remember that date as 18 days before President Richard Nixon was forced out of the White House. The maximum of 80 computer programmers at a time and from the entire state of Oregon indicated that there were only a few hundred computer programmers in Oregon in 1974. Back in the 1980s and within the nuclear research laboratories in the United States where active supercomputing research is conducted, I was treated like a security threat. I was de facto an illegal alien who sought refuge at the frontier of supercomputing knowledge. For the record, my earlier supercomputer accounts were revoked whenever it was discovered that I was black and sub-Saharan African. Because my supercomputer accounts were revoked, my survival strategy was to stay low-key and, and do so during my first 16 years as a supercomputer scientist. As a black and African research supercomputer scientist in Corvallis, Oregon, my quintessential question was this. What did my isolating identity do to me as a research scientist? In Covalis, Oregon, 
I lived a very isolating identity and I grappled with existential issues. After 16 years of unrecognized supercomputer research, I began to wonder if one day my contributions will be forgotten. Being the first person to be referred to as a supercomputer scientist confused a lot of people and did so in part because I was black and African. As a black parallel supercomputer scientist, I was mocked and made fun of because I worked alone and tried to turn this science fiction of parallel processing into the non-fiction that is today's supercomputer. Back in 1974, Kida Hall, the symbol of mathematics in Corvallis, Oregon, United States, was a seemingly majestic structure. So were the physics and the engineering buildings. Back in 1974, in Corvallis, Oregon, the computer science department was hinged in a hastily put together trailer. In 1974, I didn't see a future in the field of computer science because it lacked the respectability to be housed in a multi-story concrete building. In May and June 1974, I lived at 15 Edgewood, Edgewood Way, Corvallis, Oregon, United States. That was the residence of Ted and Connie Falk, Falk. Ted was a chemical engineer that retrained as a physician, and Connie was a high school teacher. From March 1975 through June 1977, I parked my red two-speed bicycle at the back of Kida Hall at 2000 Southwest Campus Way, Corvallis, Oregon, that was 190 feet from the supercomputer that I was programming, that was the world's fastest computer when it was manufactured back in December 1965. From October 1975 through January 1976, I lived at 2540 Southwest Whiteside Drive, Corvallis, Oregon, United States. That was the residence of Fred and Anne Merrifield. Fred was a noted civil engineer who co-founded a global engineering company called CH2M. I rode my red two-speed bicycle that I bought for $10 to 2000 Southwest Campus Way, Corvallis, Oregon, a distance of 2.6 miles where I used the teletype to assess and program the first supercomputer to be rated at 1 million instructions per second and that was 190 feet away and across the street. The essence of my existence is abstract mathematics that is impenetrable to most research scientists and solving grand challenge initial boundary value mathematical problems and solving them by massively parallel supercomputing their algebraic approximations was also impenetrable to the most able research mathematicians. Back in 1941, the largest system of equations of algebra that could be solved involved only 29 unknowns. The ENIAC and UNIVAC supercomputers came along in 1946 and 51, respectively. The CDC 3300 supercomputer that I programmed in Corvallis, Oregon, was introduced in, 19, in December 1965, and in that year, it was the fastest computer in the world, or the number one ranked supercomputer. The CDC 3300 supercomputer was used to forecast the weather. 
the theorized parallel supercomputing that I invented in my head back in the 1970s was different from the practical parallel supercomputing that I invented later in the 1980s. Through two decades of trial and error, I learned that I could only invent the parallel supercomputer that could be invented, or rather the fastest supercomputer that the laws of physics permit me to invent. Prior to the 4th of July 1989, the parallel supercomputer was a technology that I knew but cannot explain or confirm by an experiment. I was the first person to be referred to as a supercomputer scientist. Supercomputing is a broad field. I am a supercomputer scientist that placed his emphasis on the science. Some supercomputer scientists are mathematicians who prove which abstract supercomputer can or cannot solve a grand challenge problem. Some supercomputer scientists are engineers who build supercomputers. Some supercomputer scientists are inventors who measure the speed of never before seen supercomputers and tries to invent the fastest supercomputer that is powered by new technologies. I was trained as a research mathematician, research engineer, and research physicist. I conducted my supercomputing research at the frontiers and at the crossroad where mathematics, physics, and computing met. In the 1980s, the United States Department of Energy compiled a list of 20 impossible to solve problems that were very important. Those 20 problems we are thereafter dubbed the 20 grand challenges of supercomputing. Those 20 grand challenge problems we are to computing for the seven millennium problems we are to mathematics. The reason the grand challenge problems that pertain to physics were exceptionally difficult was that each problem can only be solved by a polymath who has command and mastery of physics, algebra, calculus, and computer science. My parallel processed solution of the grand challenge problem was highlighted in the June 20, 1990 issue of the Wall Street Journal and was described as cover stories of top mathematical publications. My complete solution was described in my very lengthy series of online lectures. Only a polymath will have the confidence to tackle the grand challenge problem. Back in the 1970s and 80s, extreme scale computational mathematicians didn't deem the parallel processing of initial boundary value problems of mathematical physics as merely difficult. Mathematicians deemed the parallel processing of real-world grand challenge problems as impossible. For that reason, it was then said that parallel processing was a beautiful theory that lacked an experimental confirmation. My contribution to the development of the computer, of the supercomputer, is this. I provided that lockdown experimental confirmation of parallel supercomputing and I made that discovery at 8.15 in the morning of the 4th of July 1989 in Los Alamos, New Mexico, United States. I remember that date because it was the US Independence Day. I discovered practical supercomputing and I discovered the supercomputer technology across my ensemble of 65,536 processors that was the precursor to the current world record 
of 10.65 million processors. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm finished, Emma Ajayi. Insightful and brilliant lecture.